A very good morning to you and welcome to Bartley Christian Church. We are so glad that you can join us for service this morning as we celebrate Family Life Month in Bartley. The theme for Family Life Month is The Journey, where we will journey through and look at singlehood, marriage and living a legacy. So three sermons over three weeks. There will also be two workshops, one on work-life harmony and the other one on parenting. So this morning, we are privileged to have Pastor Rick Toh to preach the Word of God to us. Pastor Rick is the lead pastor of Yochukang Chapel, and he was a lecturer in a local polytechnic before the Lord called him into full-time pastoral ministry, and he's happily married to Janice, and he has two sons. So let's commit this morning's service into God's hands. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, we want to thank you for this morning, and we commit ourselves into your hands. And we pray that this morning, the Lord, that you will speak to us through the songs, through your word, so powerfully that, Lord, you will open our hearts, you will convict our hearts and help us to respond to you, help us to know you more and help us to worship you more and help us to follow and obey you. So, Lord, may you be with us this morning and really, really come and touch us and our hearts as we journey together with you and follow after you. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The world says, you are all alone, no one cares about you. In Christ, I am never alone. Deuteronomy 31.8 The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid, do not be discouraged. The world says, you constantly give in to the desires of your flesh. You are fighting a losing battle. In Christ, I am more than a conqueror. Romans 8, 37. Not in all these things, we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. Shall I 
for me. I know who stands behind the God of angel armies is always by my side. The one who reigns forever, he is a friend of mine. The God of angel armies is always by my The world says, you are unloved, you will never find a sense of belonging anywhere. In Christ, I am a child of God. John 1, 12. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. The world says, you are going through suffering because of your sin. In Christ, I can rejoice in trials. Romans 5, 3 to 4. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? lost but he brought me in who oh, his love for me who oh, his love for me who oh, the sun sets free who oh, is free
the world says, you're too fat, you're too skinny, you're not good looking enough, nobody loves you. In Christ, I am the image and the glory of God. Genesis 1.27 So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. The world says, you are not good enough. You need to work harder to earn your salvation. In Christ, I have been reconciled to God through the death of Christ Jesus. Romans 5.10 For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. How much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life?
the world says you need to have the best credentials and earn lots of money to lead a comfortable life on earth. In Christ, my citizenship is in heaven, from which I eagerly await his coming. Philippians 3.20 But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a saviour from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. The world says, you are hypocritical and judgmental. You can never belong to the community of saints. In Christ, I am one with God the Father and Jesus the Son. John 17, 23. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Father, we thank you that no matter how the devil tries to accuse us or how the world tells us lies, we know that in Christ we have everything. We know that because of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, we can come into your presence holy and blameless because we have been made spotless by the blood of the Lamb. Thank you, Jesus, for giving us your everything. Thank you in Jesus' name. Greetings, brothers and sisters in Bali Christian Church. I send you greetings from Yuchakang Chapel. My name is Rick. I'm the lead pastor of Yuchakang Chapel. Thank you for giving me this privilege to share God's word with you. Allow me to begin with a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for bringing us together to listen to your word. And I pray that, Lord, you will open our hearts to receive your word illumine our mind to understand your word may your word shed today 
not return to you void, but that you will accomplish your purposes in our lives, transforming us into Christ's likeness. So let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our heart be found pleasing and acceptable in thy sight, O Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. A marriage guru was invited to be a keynote speaker in a sold out marriage conference. After the first night of talks, several attendees came to the marriage guru and thanked him and congratulated him for his talks and the marriage guru was feeling victorious. But then there is a young man who came forward and actually suggested that his, his methods and tips don't work. That he has tried all these methods and still he can't find his soulmate and he is lonely. The second night, again, the marriage guru gave his talk and after that, a lot of attendees came forward and thanked him again and he felt validated. But now, there's a young woman who came forward and criticized him that his approaches are too simplistic, that she has tried them all and it didn't work and that she can't find her soulmate and she is lonely. The next day, the marriage guru was scratching his head and wondering about this young man and young woman. Both of them were young, well-groomed, good-looking, professional, have a good career path, and they, he, he just couldn't understand how in the world they cannot find a partner for life. So he thought, maybe what I should do is to be their cupid, and that is to really bring them together, matchmaking. So he actually contacted each of them separately and asked them out for a lunch date at the same place. On the very day itself, during the lunch, the young woman came in first. So the marriage guru quickly ushered her to sit away from the, uh, away from the entrance, facing away from the entrance. And not too long, the young man appeared at the entrance. The marriage guru quickly waved his hand to signal to the young man. And as the young man was walking towards where they are sitting in the restaurant, the woman turned and saw this young man. And guess what happened? No, it's not love at first sight. They have a bewildered look. In fact, an embarrassed look. So the marriage guru was a little bit taken by surprise. And to overcome the awkward silence, he said, perhaps I should introduce. But before he can go any further, uh, this young man actually say, uh, sorry, sir, I didn't know you know my wife. And then the young woman say, and I didn't know you already know my husband. Perhaps some of us are caught, likewise, surprised. Uh, we assume that this young man and young woman uh, were single and they're looking for a soulmate, looking for a partner in life and must be, they must be single, right? This story uh, reveals two fallacies. Firstly, we think that if you are married, you are not lonely. Those who are lonely will be the singers. Singers are lonely. And we tend to think that single, being single is like you are in a transition state and it's a deficient state and you need to be married in order to overcome your loneliness. If I were to ask you a question, what does marriage celebrate? Maybe in your mind, immediately there are a lot of words coming out, all right? A lot of uh, vocabulary. For example, oh, it celebrates oneness, intimacy. Oh, Christ and the church. Oh, the love of God and many other things. But now I change and ask you, what does singleness celebrate. Perhaps your mind went blank for a moment. Perhaps there's a hesitation to see singleness as a thing to be celebrated. If marriage is God's design, part of the kingdom life on earth, the question is, is singleness God's design, part of the kingdom life on earth? Or rather, singleness is an awkward transition human in waiting 
a deficient life. Today, I want to put to you that singleness is not a deficient life, not humans in waiting, not an tr awkward transition, but that singleness is a celebration of wholeness in Christ and devotion to Christ. That singleness is a celebration of wholeness in Christ and devotion to Christ. Let's begin by understanding why singleness is a celebration of wholeness in Christ. Colossians chapter 2, verse 10. So you also are complete through your union with Christ, who is the head over every ruler and authority. In the ESV version, it says, So you have been filled in Him. You have been filled in Him. We are made to be complete in Christ. Nothing else should fill us but Christ Himself. Remember, Augustine of Hippo said this, You have made us for yourself, O God, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Or perhaps some of us know of this quote by Pascal, There is a God-shaped vacuum in our heart, and it cannot be satisfied by any created thing, but only by God the Creator, revealed through Jesus Christ. Our identity and wholeness is in Christ alone. But sadly, this culture seems to tell us it's not true. The world that we live in tells us that we are incomplete without a status, without possessions, without money, or without relationships, without marriage. Sadly, this culture has creeped into the church as well. The mindset that human or singles are incomplete, they need to be married to become complete. This is not what the scriptures say. Colossians chapter 2, verse 10 says, We are all complete in Christ. Whether you are married or you are not married, whether you are single or you are widow, we are all complete in Christ. We need to overcome three misunderstandings. Firstly, the misunderstanding on the passage in Genesis. When we read in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, it is not good for man to be alone. What comes to your mind? You know, our imagination will be Adam was walking in the Garden of Eden, feeling so lonely feeling so down, like this picture, this uh, cartoon picture. But read carefully. I hope that you erase the imagination because it is not biblical. If you read the passage carefully, it didn't say Adam was lonely. But it is God saying it is not good for man to be alone. Now, lonely and alone are two different words. Lonely is about the emotional state, but alone, but alone is about the physical state. And God is saying it is not good for man to be alone. The passage did not say, Adam came to God and said, I'm so lonely. Not that way. I think that we need to look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, in the context with Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1 gives us the whole creation story. And in that, there's a few verses, just a couple of verses talk about a, a creation of mankind, right? It says in Genesis chapter 1 verse 27, So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So Genesis chapter 1 verse 27 gives us the intention right from the beginning that God had in mind to create male and female. Then in chapter 2, in the storytelling, it revealed to us how God slowly created first Adam and then later on Eve. But the intention at the beginning is already he will create male and female. In other words, creating Eve is not an afterthought. After he observed Adam alone and feeling lonely and then he said, maybe I should do something more for Adam. No, right from the start, it's going to be male and female, 
but the storytelling is first he create Adam first, and then after that he create Eve by saying it is not good for Adam to be alone. So in that understanding, we realize that when God say it is not good for Adam to be alone, it can be understood as God saying, merely saying that because he want to create mankind in his own image, and that can only be fulfilled when he can create two complementary gender. So when Adam was created first, mankind, the creation of mankind is incomplete and he need to create Eve so that both complementary gender can display his image more adequately. It is not that Adam was lonely, but it is God saying Adam alone as one, one gender is unable to adequately express his amazing image. God also made Eve as a way to help him, to assist him, to fulfill the mandate God had given to them, which is to be fruitful and to and multiply, subdue the earth and tend the garden. In other words, what can you learn about marriage here? Marriage is a mission. It is God's means to fulfill his purposes. It is not a providence from God to cure man's loneliness. It is so important for us to understand this. So I hope next time when you read Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, you'll not be like, you see Adam walking in the Garden of Eden feeling lonely because there's nothing in that passage that tell us this way. There's nothing. The second misunderstanding is on sex. We live in a hyper-sexualized world that makes sex an idol. The fear of living a life without experiencing sexual intimacy becomes unbearable in the modern generation. Said to say, pornography and all the M18 and R21 shows are really uh, uh, over-glorifying sex to the point that people think that without sex, life is deficient. However, if you read the Bible carefully, you realize that while sex comes from God, as in God created sex, and is therefore natural, but it's not necessary. Sex is good, but it is not ultimate. Sex is not a basic need. It's not like food, drink, food or water. You know. It is not a basic need. And sex is not our deepest need. I suggest to you that deep and profound intimacy is our deepest need. And this Deep and profound intimacy can be found in our relationship with God and in the community of Christ. If life without sex is deficient, Paul wouldn't have said this in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 7. He tells the, the church at Corinth, say, I wish all were as I am, I myself am. And he's referring to him being single. I wish you are single like me. If Life without sex is deficient, then Paul shouldn't have given this advice. It is ungodly and wrong. Again, think about the example of our Lord Jesus Christ, or John the Baptist, and other prophets like Jeremiah. These inform us that singleness and life without sex is not deficient. So the question is, why then did God create sex? Why did God create sex? Perhaps John Piper can give us insights on this. Therefore, God created us in his image, male and female, with personhood and sexual passion, passions, so that when he comes to us in this world, there will be these powerful words and images to describe the promises and the pleasure of our covenant relationship with him through Christ. Wow. Again, you come to realize that God created sex in order to use it for his purposes, to point to something that's even greater. Remember the book on the Song of Songs. It is one such book whereby God used sexual innuendo to grant us a glimpse of the heavenly intimacy, the pleasure and the ecstasy that's awaiting us in our union in Christ in the day of consummation. 
So sex is not ultimate, my brothers and sisters. It points to the ultimate, and there is our union in Christ. We must also overcome our mis misunderstanding regarding posterity. In our Asian culture, being able to carry on the family life is so important, right? We must all have children. Our sur surname must pass on from one generation to another generation. When you turn to the Old Testament, you realize that there's also an emphasis on posterity. Physical posterity is part of the covenantal promise of Abraham. Let's take a look at Genesis chapter 17, verse 5. And he brought him outside, and there's God bringing Abraham outside and say, Look towards heaven and number the stars, if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. If you refer back to if you refer to Genesis chapter 17, verse 5, this is a God making a covenant with Abraham, saying, No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your son shall be Abraham, but but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. Therefore, in the old covenant, having physical offspring was a sign of God's favor and blessing. And oftentimes, when you look at the Old Testament, the lack of physical offspring was seen as a punishment or a curse. But what about the New Covenant, the New Testament? What happened? In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10, it says this, For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, shall make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. Hebrews 2.10 say that God, the Creator, bring many sons to glory. Of course, we can add and daughters. All right? Bring many sons and daughters to glory. How did God have so many sons and daughters? It is through Christ, who is the author and founder who is the author and perfecter of our salvation. It is through Christ dying on the cross, making atonement for our sins, that now all of us are sons and daughters of God. So Christopher Yuan said this, Here is the radical truth on family that Jesus inaugurates through the new covenant. The people of the old covenant grew by procreation, while the people of the new covenant grow by regeneration, spiritual regeneration. Remember Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, that says this, Go, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. This is spiritual posterity. This is spiritual posterity. The procreation mandate given to Adam and the covenant that God made with Abraham are now reissued through Christ. Go and make disciples. Go and multiply spiritual children. You know, Paul understands this so well. That's why if you read his letters, look at the way how he regards his disciples, those who he had brought to Christ. 3, uh, 3 John chapter 1, verse 4. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. He is single, but he considered those that he had brought to Christ as his children. Titus chapter 1 verse 4, To Titus, my true son, in now common faith. Philemon verse 8 then, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 17, I send to you Timothy, my son, whom I love. Paul see all these disciples, those he has brought to Christ as his children. He experienced spiritual posterity, even though he was a singer. And I want to encourage all of us, therefore, likewise, to know that we can be engaged in spiritual prosperity, every one of us in Christ Jesus, if we take Matthew 28 verse 19 seriously to go and make disciples. So I hope that we will overcome these three misunderstandings. Misunderstanding Genesis, then we look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, we will have a, re 
a new understanding to know that it's not saying Adam was lonely and that's why God created Eve and put them together in a marriage union because that's not true. Adam was not lonely. lonely. That we will not misunderstand sex, thinking a life without sex is misery, is a deficient life because it's not true. Sex is not the ultimate, but it points to the ultimate, our union in Christ. And finally, we will not misunderstand posterity, knowing that in the new covenant, we are able to experience spiritual posterity. So, singleness celebrates wholeness in Christ. It reminds us that we are whole in Christ. It reminds that even the married, that remember we are all whole in Christ. We are all complete in Christ. Singleness also celebrate devotion to Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse uh, 7 to 8, Paul carry on to say this, I wish that all of you were as I am, but each of you has your own gift from God. One has this gift, another has that. Now to the unmarried and the widows, I say it is good for them to stay unmarried as I do. So here Paul used the word gift, G-I-F-T, to highlight that whether you are widow, you are single, or you are married, it is a gift from God. So singleness is a gift and not a misfortune. I suggest that it is a calling and not a curse. A calling from God, a gift from God. Elizabeth Elliot said this, If you are single today, the portion assigned to you for today is singleness. It is God's gift. Singleness ought not to be viewed as a problem, nor marriage as a right. God in his wisdom and love grants either as a gift. So singleness is not a problem to be solved. It is a gift from God as God's aside portion for us. And each one of us will have a season or two, a season or two when we are single. And it's important for us to know that it is not a cursed life when we are single. We can still be complete in Christ and that we can still dedicate this season of singleness to be devoted to Christ. So, Paul carry on to say this in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 35. I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to Christ. In context, Paul was addressing the unmarried. He was addressing, he's speaking to those who are not married yet, telling them that you can be free from earthly anxieties. The unmarried man can be anxious only on what to please the Lord, on things to please the Lord. But the married man has to be anxious with many other domestic responsibilities. So he's trying to tell the unmarried, it is okay to remain single. And everything that I say is to tell you why. Because I want to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. And therefore, singleness is a, is a time to celebrate our devotion to Christ. It reminds us that we are all ought to be devoted to Christ. Undivided devotion to Christ. Singleness has the benefit of pursuing Christ and His kingdom without the danger of being distracted by added responsibilities that comes with a married life. Perhaps i show you this picture. In God's kingdom economy, life isn't a priority list, but an obedient circle. Now, what's the benefit that the singles have above the marriage? You will notice on the left-hand circle that it is a life of single, where Christ is on the throne, but you realize that the number of dimensions around the circumference are fewer compared to the one that's married. The circles on the right-hand side that depicts the married life Christ is still at the center on the throne of his life or her life, but there are many more dots expressing many more dimensions in their life they have to look into. Now I want to emphasize that when I put these two circles and put Christ on the throne, it's to highlight whether you're single or married, even though 
the merit may have many more things to think about, but all the same, we must pursue devotion to Christ. All the same, Christ must be on the throne. The Lordship of the Christ must happen in our life. But the reality is we realize that those who are married must look into various, more, there are more things to look into and there are more things that they have to learn obedient in Christ. But, the, but for the singers, they are able to devote their time and their energy and energy in those few things that's given to them to pursue all these things under the Lordship of Christ. They can pursue knowing, loving, and serving God all the way. They, they can embrace the unique opportunities to serve God in ways that is not possible for those who have a family. Ecclesiastes of the 12 verse 1 say this, Remember your Creator in the days of your youth. Why? Because in the days of your youth, when you're single, you have a lot of time. And when you spend those time to pursue God, you build a good and strong foundation that will secure you and help you to face life in the next season. So that even when you are married and you have children, you remain devoted in Christ. Therefore, those who are single celebrates devotion to Christ. It reminds even the merits that we are supposed to be devoted to Christ. Singleness is a celebration of wholeness in Christ and devotion to Christ. I want to share some application to the different groups of people in the church. First, I want to talk to those who are single. Whether you are single and you're not married, or whether you are single because you are now a widow, always remember that you are whole in Christ. You are not human in waiting. You are not deficient. If you are looking to marriage, remember that marriage is not a providence to try to cure your loneliness. Because if you are doing that, then most likely you are pursuing marriage with the wrong motivation. It, there's a very high possibility that you can make marriage become your idol. But remember, marriage is a mission to fulfill God's purposes. Pursue that understanding. And that will help you to have a right understanding and regard for marriage. I appeal to the single as well to take the opportunity in this season of singleness to pursue undivided devotion to Christ. Take time to read Christian literature. Pursue knowing God. Pursue loving Him more and more. And pursue serving Him as well. Now to the merits. I want to appeal to you not to make our family, our spouse and our children to become idols in our life. Let us not become self-absorbed, so caught up with our own earthly family that we have no time for God and no time for the community. And let's not exaggerate the bliss of marriage. You know, so oftentimes when you go to Instagram and Facebook, you will see those who are married in their anniversary posting a lot of um, blessings. And they were, and I think it's, it's okay, you know, sometimes we will start talking about our spouse, thank God for our spouse, and then bring out all the good qualities and place it all there in Instagram, and then let everybody see it. And even those who are single see it say, oh, how I wish to be like that, right? And it seems everybody said, wow, those who are married are really living life of paradise, you know? Like it was so amazing, right? I'm, I'm feeling that I lack something, you know? Just look at their Instagram report and their Facebook, their life is so amazing, you know? To be married is always so amazing, so positive. But we know the reality, this is not true. Instagram and Facebook only carry one-sided story. Marriage is hard work. Marriage is hard work. Hear it from the pastor. I bring my wife, pastor's wife, to say it together. Both of us will be quick to tell you that marriage is hard work. We step on each other's toes. We have our idiosyncrasies. Just last night, I was so angry with my wife that I didn't want to talk to her. Uh, this morning, I start talking to her. Lah. You know, I start uh, connecting with her again. Because sometimes, and it's not those big things, sometimes it's those small little things that make us get on our nerves and we find very hard and we need space. I felt there's a need for us to be authentic, to talk about not just the bliss of marriage, but the struggle of marriage. 
And in the balance of portraying both, help us to remember the mission of marriage. That even though sometimes marriage can be tough and hard, we choose to be committed to be married because of mission, because of God's purposes. Then people will see a difference. People will realize, oh, marriage is really about the mission of serving God's purposes. That even though these people go through difficult season, they will still glorify God. And that will help the singers to understand that, okay, it's not like marriage is, is heaven on earth, you know. And the focus of marriage as mission will become clearer. I appeal to the merits to connect to the community of Christ. That we will not become reclusive, as I mentioned just now, self-absorbed, withdrawn to our own earthly family. Finally, I want to appeal to us as a church, as a local body of Christ, that we will make sure that we will not emphasize or celebrate God's design for marriage at the expense of God's design for singles. That's why I'm very touched when Pastor Jason actually connected with me and said, would you preach about singleness? I'm very excited. I'm, I said yes almost immediately because to me, it is... It is a way to tell myself that I must also celebrate God's design for singleness and not just talk about God's design for marriage. And I'm so excited to know Bali Christian Church is having that balanced celebration to help both the singers and the marriage know that both, both seasons are gift from God, calling from God. And let us serve God in whatever gift and calling He has given to us. I want to end with this passage in Mark chapter 3, verse 33 to 35. And this is Jesus speaking. And he answered them, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. Every time I look at this passage, I always wonder how were the mother Mary and the brothers of Jesus uh, early brothers of uh, bro early brothers of Jesus feeling, but look at this carefully, and I'm going to say something that perhaps uh, some of you will feel very uncomfortable. But this is biblical truth, unless you can tell me how to interpret this passage if I get it wrong. This passage is saying spiritual family takes precedence to natural family, and it's very obvious. Because when you're in heaven, our ties are not about natural family. It's our ties is in Christ, the spiritual family. What that will last through eternity is the spiritual family. And how sad that we find ourselves so bogged down, oftentimes putting priority to our earthly family. And I know there's a need because we need to pay attention to our domestic responsibility. But the saddest thing, is that often a time we place the spiritual family as one of the last few priority. And because it's one of the last few priority in our life, it is the first to go. When we are busy in work, busy with family, earthly family, the first to go is the spiritual family. But look at Mark chapter 3, and you realize we are not biblical. We are not abiding to what God's word is telling us about. A spiritual family takes precedence with, to earthly family, natural family, then we must be committed in the community of Christ. Whether you're married or single, if we are committed to, have, to this community of Christ, then you realize that the singers does not feel deficient anymore. They do not find that they have to always pursue intimacy only through marriage because intimacy can be found in the community in Christ. Intimacy can be found in Christ. I pray whether you are married or you are single, all of us will know that we are whole in Christ and we are called to be devoted to Christ. And I ask for the singers to celebrate that, to remind all of us, single or married, this truth. Thank you. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I come before you and pray for my brothers and sisters in Bali Christian Church that the truth on the celebration of singleness will liberate us from any falsehood 
when we think about singleness and help us and ground us to this truth that we are all to be whole in Christ and we are all to have undivided devotion to Christ. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. We want to thank Pastor Rick for his message to us this morning. And indeed, singleness is a celebration of our wholeness in Christ and also our devotion to Christ. That in Christ, you and I, we are complete, whether you are married or not. And it's true you know, that sometimes we have raised marriage so high up that singlehood became something that is viewed as deficient or, in, or something like something wrong with you. So to all the singers in Bartley, to all the singers who's watching this video today, we want to say to you that we are sorry. We are sorry for making you feel that you are deficient. We are sorry to, for making you feel that you are lesser than those who are married. And we ask for your forgiveness. And we pray that together, whether you're single or you're married, that we will give our all, we will give our best to our Lord Jesus Christ in the season He has placed us in. That we, whether we are single or married, together we can celebrate His gift for us in singlehood and also in marriage. That together, as God's people, as God's church, we will all press on to fulfill His calling and His mission for us. Let us pray. Father God, we thank You for Your Word this morning to us. That indeed, Father, we can celebrate singlehood, we can celebrate marriage, because all of these are your design, according to your plan, and it is good for us. And we thank you for giving us this gift in this season, that we want to commit ourselves to you, to be wholeheartedly devoted to you. So Lord, may you continue to speak to us, may you continue to help us, encourage and challenge us to follow you, to be a blessing to the people around us, that together as a spiritual family, we will grow together, walk together and honour you and be a blessing to those around us. So Lord, we thank you. We thank you for being our God. We thank you for adopting us into your family, that we are your sons and your daughters. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And now may you receive the benediction. May the love of God our Father and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with all of us here, now and forever. Amen. Thank you for joining us this morning. The Lord bless you. May the Lord send you out into wherever you are to be His sword and to be His light. Thank you and God bless.